Welcome back to my video series on how to make an automatic battler game like Vampire Survivors. In this part, we're going to further flesh out our game by adding custom graphics, setting random enemy spawns, refining our attacks, and more. My name's Adam, also known as Drummer Who Codes, and let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is create some more interesting graphics. You can either import your own graphics, which I'll be covering in a later video, or you can import graphics directly from the GDevelop store, which includes both free and paid graphics assets. For this series, we'll only use assets that are freely available for use. Let's start by getting rid of the objects we created in the last video. Don't worry though, we'll be creating new ones in just a moment. We'll leave the ground though. Speaking of the ground, let's go ahead and do something about those graphics. Double click ground in the objects panel. Then click the Replace button, and choose from Asset Store. Let's type ground into the search box and pick out a nice ground graphic. I think I like this one. Now I'll click Apply, and the old background is replaced by the new one. Since this is a tiled sprite, we can resize and reshape it however we want, and it will keep the same pattern. Let's go ahead and make our game area really big. If you hold the Control key on your Windows PC, then use the scroll wheel on your mouse, you can zoom in and out. Let's grab the handles and increase the size of our game world. You can make it pretty much as large or as small as you like. Now let's recreate our player object, but this time instead of choosing new object from scratch, we'll choose the asset store tab. As I said in the beginning of this video, the asset store contains many free and paid assets that you can drop directly into your game. We'll click the section for characters and you can choose whatever you like, but I'm going with the dinosaurs. I'll pick a blue dinosaur to represent our player in the game. After selecting the character, click on Add to Scene, and now our new character is ready to go. If you double click on the player object, you'll see that our character already has animations set. This is another benefit of adding assets directly from the asset store. In a later video, I'll show you how to import custom assets and set your own animations, but this will work for now. Go ahead and close the character object window, and we'll create our enemy character. For the enemy, I'll choose the red dino. Click Add to Scene, and our enemy character is ready to go. Let's add our characters to the scene, and hit Preview. It looks like we forgot to add a behavior. Also, our dinos are looking a little small. Let's take care of both of those issues. First, let's add the top-down movement behavior to our player, just like we did in the last video. I'm going to hurry through this part, so be sure to go back and watch the last video if you have trouble following along. While we're at it, we'll add the fire bullets behavior. You'll notice this one is already in the project from where we added it last time. I'll set the cooldown to 0.75 this time. And we'll add a new behavior called Health Points and Damage. Click Install in Project, and don't forget to add it to your list of behaviors for your player object. When you're all done, click Apply. Now, when we hit preview, our player can move around the screen. Let's go ahead and make our enemy follow the player just like we did in the last video. Now, let's add our bullet back to the scene like last time, but with a sprite from the asset store. This one looks pretty good. Don't forget to rename it something you'll remember. Let's add our firing behavior like we did before. Hit Preview, and so far so good. Our sprites are still a little small though, 
there are a couple of ways that we can deal with that. We can resize them directly in the scene, but it can be tricky to make them uniform. If we enable the grid, it makes it a little bit easier, but I think I'm going to do it in the Events tab. Click to add a new event. For the condition, we'll select at the beginning of the scene. For the action, we'll select the player, then scale, and set it to multiply by three, which means that our player will be three times the normal size of the sprite. Now our player sprite looks much better on the screen. We'll worry about the enemy sprite in a moment. But first, we're going to make our enemy randomly spawn around the screen. For that, we'll need a new event. Select the repeat every X seconds command. We'll call this one enemy spawn timer and set it to trigger every 0.5 seconds for now. For the action, we want to create an enemy object. So we'll select enemy and then create an object. For the position, we want it to spawn the enemy somewhere around the screen randomly. We can do that with a function called random in range. A function is simply a list of instructions that we can run with a single command. Much like behaviors, gdevelop comes with many built-in functions, as do many game engines and even full programming languages. For the X position, we'll type the function random in range, followed by the empty parentheses. Every word in the function has to have the first letter capitalized and there can't be any spaces. You'll notice as you start typing that gdevelop will pull up a list of auto completion suggestions to help you along. In the parentheses, you can put a series of values called arguments. Each function that you use will expect a certain list of values as arguments with some functions requiring no arguments at all, even though they have parentheses. The parentheses tells the program that this is a function. The random and range function expects two values. The first one is the lowest value that it can be, and the second one is the highest value that it can be. The function will choose a random value between those two limits. To understand what we're about to do, you'll have to know how a computer calculates graphics. Do you remember the Cartesian coordinate system from grade school? We all learned that the x-axis runs horizontally from side to side and the y-axis runs vertically from bottom to top. The zero point, that is the zero on the x-axis and the zero on the y-axis is in the center. The x number increases as you travel to the right and decreases as you travel to the left, with the y increasing as you go up and decreasing as you go down. Computers do things a bit differently. The X and Y axes still run in the same directions, but the zero point is at the top left corner of the screen, and Y increases as you go down and decreases as you go up. The X value is the same as you learned in school. So if we select a random value on the X axis between zero, the far left, and the full width of the screen, the far right, we should get a random value somewhere on the screen. Let's go ahead and do that. For the first value, we'll put 0. For the second value, we could put 1920, since that's the screen width of our project. But what if we change that later on? Instead, we can use the function screen width, which calculates the full width of the screen. Don't forget to put empty parentheses at the end so gdeveloped knows that it's a function, and don't forget the final closing parenthesis at the end. We'll use similar values for the Y position, but with a function that calculates the screen height instead of the screen width. Click OK and Preview. And we have randomly spawning enemies. They're a little small, so we can scale them up the same way we did with the player object, but we'll set that to happen right after each enemy is spawned. That looks so much better. Before we go on, let's delete the original enemy in the scene as we won't be needing him anymore. Have you noticed that our player seems to lock onto one enemy the whole time? Let's fix our attack so that we always attack the enemy closest to us. First, we need to create a new group for the enemies. Click the group tab and add a new group. And call it enemies. Then edit group 
to add the enemy object to the group. Now, whenever an enemy is spawned, it will automatically be added to this group. Back over to the Events tab, find the empty condition that fires the bullets and add a condition to it. Select the Enemies group and pick Nearest Object and set it to the player's position. Click OK and Preview to see your work in action. Now we always fire at the closest enemy. You also may have noticed that the bullets sometimes fly right over the enemy they're aiming for, and the bullets seem to be coming from the player object's shoulder. Let's fix that by adjusting the origin point on our projects. Much like the zero point on the Cartesian plane in our game map, the origin point, meaning the point that's used to calculate our object's positions, is at the top left by default, but we want it at the center of the sprite. To fix that, let's go back to the Scene tab, double-click on the player object, and click Edit Points. Grab the dot at the top right of the box, that's the origin point, and drag it somewhere near the center. It doesn't have to be perfect, and we can always change it later. Click Close, and Apply, and do the same thing for the enemy object. Run the preview, and everything works. Next, we're going to set up our health system. We already added the health and damage behavior to our player object. Let's go ahead and add it to the enemy object as well. Every object with this behavior has 100 health points by default. We'll have the player take 10 damage from every enemy collision, and the enemy will take 50 damage for each bullet collision. Let's start by setting up a collision event with the enemy object and the bullet object like we did in the last video. This time, however, instead of deleting the enemy object, we're going to apply damage to an object. 50 points of damage to be precise. Then we'll add a subcondition by right clicking and selecting add a sub event. The sub-event adds a new condition that is checked every time a bullet collides with an enemy, but the action only runs if the sub-condition is also true. For the condition, we'll click enemy, then health points, is less than or equal to zero. If this condition is true, we'll delete the enemy. In the last video, I challenged you to figure out how to delete the bullet object upon collision with an enemy. Did you figure it out? In the bullet collision event, simply delete the bullet object. Let's see how that works. And it works perfectly. We'll set up our player's health in much the same way. Set up a collision event between the enemy and the player object. Apply damage to an object, which will be the player, for 10 points of damage. And then a sub-event to check the player's health just like we did with the enemy object a moment ago. Let's preview and... Whoa, we died really quickly. Let's give ourselves some invincibility time after taking damage. Otherwise, we'll take damage every frame that we're in contact with an enemy object. Go back to the Scene tab, select the Player object, then the Behaviors tab, and change Damage Cooldown to 1 so that we only take damage one time every second maximum. That seems much more fair. We won't die instantly, but we can still die if we get overwhelmed. I hope you've enjoyed making this game so far. Be sure to keep an eye out for the next video where we'll add a health bar, an experience point system, a new weapon, sound effects, and more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.